A world choking on waste and running out of resources. Something has to change. How can we design an economy where we don't waste all these resources? Meet the people grabbing opportunities around the world in a new way of doing business where nothing goes to waste. The circular economy will change how we use everyday products and our urban landscape. It could bring massive environmental and financial benefits. This is just the beginning of really being able to solve a global problem. But is the world ready? at one of the world's largest landfills near Jakarta. Atma Wijaya is one of thousands scratching out a living. He often gets injured by broken glass and nails, and there's an even bigger danger. Kadang-kadang anak malam itu kan nyari malam ada yang tidur di warung, warung kosong kan. Kadang-kadang ya lagi ngantuk itulah. Ya ada orang, ada juga yang meninggal itu dulu. Ada berapa orang itu? Ya habis mau bilang di mana lagi ya bu ya. Memang nasib saya memang udah begini. Anak saya juga memang nerima. Ya dijalanin aja gitu bu. But should they live with it? and should the world. This is the linear approach to consumption. Produce, use, dispose. But it's not really working anymore, not for the environment and not for the economy. Half a world away, an influential think tank is promoting a more circular approach. We extract more resources from our planet than our planet can replenish. So we need 1.6 Earths to be able to feed all of us, but also to provide resources. And that's the problem. We don't have 1.6 Earths. We have one planet Earth. Almost everything we make in this economy is designed for a throwaway culture. Almost everything gets either burned, dumped, or landfilled. And not only are we throwing away a lot of resources, but we waste also a lot of money. The foundation estimates the world economy would benefit by trillions of dollars if we changed our relationship with resources and products. The daily items we take for granted would stay in circulation for much longer, even indefinitely, either as the same thing or repurposed into something else. And so, the circular economy is based on three key principles. Design out waste and pollution, keep materials in use, and regenerate natural systems. And when you apply these principles, there's an opportunity to capture this multi-trillion economic opportunity, while also tackling some of the biggest challenges that we face today around climate change, biodiversity loss, and plastic pollution. Back in Indonesia, a team is tackling plastic pollution head on. It's a notorious waste problem that also has largely untapped economic potential. Jazlan and his crew go out once a week to collect plastic from the coastline. They've collected almost 100 tons just in the past year. So it's during monsoon in the north side of Bintan, they get Plastic pollution a lot it's from the ocean, from South China Sea. But in the east side of Bintan, you might see plastic waste from the local. To be honest, some of the people, they still do purposely, they throw it into the sea. 
the rabbis. They also work in the local mangrove forests, where the plastic impacts the ecosystem for marine life. And they visit a protected marine area of Bintan. Reefs previously damaged by dynamite fishing now have to contend with fishing nets and other plastic. I want to scream, actually, if it's, I see river, ocean is full of plastic. I think why the people don't care about this? Why the people uh, use ocean like huge trash bank for them? The cleaner is part of a venture that's the brainchild of an entrepreneur who spent his life between Asia and the UK. So my background in Singapore really is on the finance side. I think it's fair to be said that I can be described as an accidental environmentalist. My wife and I were on holiday in the South Andaman Sea and it was absolutely stunning. Now, to our shock and horror, what happened overnight was the combination of a high tide, a storm, and a garbage patch. And essentially what had happened was the beach was so covered in plastic the next morning that you couldn't even walk on it. It's really shocking, and for us, it just kicked us into action. We, we knew we couldn't change the world, but we could come back to Singapore and we could start to try and make a difference. He's using his financial savvy to get the attention of backers with deep pockets. We work with companies to allow them to offset their plastic footprint by investing in ocean cleanup and waste management infrastructure projects overseas in hotspots. And that generates the capital we need to employ people on fair wages, stop plastic entering the ocean and remove plastic from the ocean. We are targeted to remove 10 million kilos of plastic from the ocean by 2025 across the seven worst plastic polluting countries all of which are either here in Southeast Asia or in South Asia. In the world of tomorrow, plastics will certainly call the tune. Plastic is a relatively recent invention derived from oil. Its undeniable usefulness has helped it reach every corner of our lives. And so the amount of plastic has exploded. By 2050, if nothing changes, there'll be more plastic in the ocean than fish. Plastic microparticles are being found in our drinking water, air, and food. It's estimated the average person could be eating a credit card worth of plastic every week. The plastic Tom's team retrieves currently goes to a so-called sanitary landfill. But he's now got investors to help build a new recovery facility. It will collect plastic before it reaches the ocean and send it for recycling. I truly believe that society can change and evolve into a more circular economy. It has to start with the waste management infrastructure. If we don't have that in place, we just cannot do it. Another project is a floating device to retrieve plastic from rivers which are the main source of plastic in the ocean. We're actually working at the moment to get the first system installed in either Vietnam or Thailand as we speak, so big things are coming. But plastic is still being produced in huge amounts, and it's still cheaper for most manufacturers to use so-called virgin plastic than try to recycle. A US company thinks its technology might be the answer. In a small town in Indiana, the founder is inspecting a brand new plant that's just weeks away from full operation. They're actually from a local company. Are they? Yep, right across the highway, Trend. I spent 30 years in the energy industry, and what brought me to the moment of wanting to found Brightmark was a realization in the energy industry of the environmental impact of what we do. What I'm feeling is an incredible sense of excitement because this is just the beginning of really being able to solve a global problem. And here we are, right at the end of construction. I'm really excited. This is claimed to be the largest plastic renewal facility in the world. 
What's different about this plant is that it can take all types of plastics mixed together. That has traditionally been either too difficult or too expensive. The plastic is shredded and turned into millions of pellets. So this is a really dense material that's ready to turn into new plastics and other useful products. The pellets are fed into a huge chamber called a pyrolyzer. Pyrolysis heats plastic to more than 300 degrees with no oxygen, which means no toxins are created. The extreme heat turns the plastic molecules into gas. That is then cooled to create new byproducts. It creates a vapor, which is turned into basically a very pure form of crude oil and a gas, like what we would get out of the ground, but we don't pull it out of the ground. The end product can be used for fuel or wax, but is also ready to be turned back into plastic right away. So yeah, why don't we walk over there real quick and grab you a delicious handful of this. <laughs> Visiting from Singapore is Shakil Rahman, the head of operations in Asia. I come from a renewable energy background. I have been developing renewable energy plants for years. This is the next step, circularity, taking something and returning it to its original purpose. I view this plant as very critical in the Asia-Pacific project development process because people from that region will want to come and see the plant, see it operating, touch and feel, so to speak. Shaquille wants to see similar plants across Asia. The first might be ready by 2025. We view the Asian market as really the market for growth because that's where most of the people are. Currently, the plastic that's in that region, they expect by 2030, almost 140 million tons of plastic to be consumed there per annum, which is huge. Plants like this now have a chance at success because manufacturers and policymakers see the value that's been lost by throwing away plastic and the technology is reaching a large enough scale to make a difference. So with long-term viable economics, it absolutely makes circularity possible. So we don't think of sustainability as just the environment or just economics. We think they work together, and that's how you solve these problems. But despite technological advances, Experts say the challenges with plastic are still serious. The problem of plastic pollution goes beyond beach cleanups. It goes beyond recycling. We need to look at it from a system level perspective and really go to the source and think about how do we design plastics so that they never become waste. But what about replacing plastic altogether? That's the focus of other innovators in Asia and beyond. It's Earth Day, the perfect time to try something new to fight plastic waste and change how business is done. Yeah, jadi kita mau ngejelasin aja sebenarnya kan kita ada bikin kampanye. Nah, jadi yang kita lakukan sebenarnya di sini kita pengen pertama kampanyenya itu dimulai dari sedotan. Jadi kita pengen. David Christian is trying to get eateries in Jakarta to switch to non-plastic straws made from rice. He's offering a month's supply for free. So Indonesia consuming about 93 million plastic straws every day. So that's, uh, when we put it together, that's equal to about 16,000 kilometers. And that's actually like the line can be from Jakarta to Mexico. We are targeting this year about 5,000 uh, food stalls uh, to be joining our programs. And hopefully by then we can replace about 1 million uh, plastic straws. So before I started uh, Ifuenco, I was uh, actually living in Canada for around four years. And then when I arrived to Jakarta, I can uh, actually really feel the difference. 
I was quite shocked because of the environment and the pollution here that we have in Jakarta. He's a serial entrepreneur, now focused on circularity, with projects across the country. In the thousand islands off the north coast of Java, a small revolution is taking place. David has hired seaweed farmers like Jamhuddin and Abdul Rashid to harvest the crop for him. Seaweed has become one of the fastest growing sectors of food production in the world. And this seaweed will be eaten too, but with a twist. Once it's harvested, the seaweed is dried. It's then sent off to be turned into tableware for restaurants, which can later be composted or eaten. Back in Jakarta, the items are already in use. Cups made from the seaweed are edible. But COVID-19 has hit demand, and David knows there's a long road ahead for him and his small team. Ivo Enko is actually my first business, right? So everything is a challenge for me. But I think one of the biggest challenges that I face now is to educate people and raising awareness of the environment. I don't think that I will ever uh, stop like doing what I'm doing right now because I believe that what I'm doing is uh, very important to the world. Yet another of his ventures is providing restaurants with biodegradable packaging. But some argue that single-use items even if not made of plastic, are still a problem because of the sheer scale of our throwaway culture. Ling Le runs a Singapore-based company that thinks the real economic solution lies in getting consumers to adopt reusable food containers. This would avoid tons of plastic and other waste. So the opportunity for packaging alone is that if we can replace about 20% of single-use packaging become reusable packaging, then that market is about $10 billion. For every usage that you use bear pack, we reduce 90% of CO2 emission compared to normal single-use packaging. So our reusable items are our box, that can be used at least 500 times, and our reusable cups made from stainless steel can be used at least 1,000 times. The selling point for restaurants is that the containers are free. When I just joined Bearpack, we have about 70 locations. And after that, uh, after six months, uh, we are now having more than double uh, the numbers. All the main food delivery services in Singapore are now on board with the venture. Consumers pay a monthly fee and can drop off the containers at any participating outlet. So just want to go through again if you are okay with that. Ling's move into the circular economy came after a variety of jobs, including helping build golf courses in Vietnam. I started to see uh, that the trees were cutting off uh, to clear the sites to make the golf courses. And um, at that moment, I was aware by how beautiful the site would be, but then I was really sad to see the tree was cut down. And then I told my boss, like, I don't know if I can do it anymore. And he told me, well, Ling, if you don't do it, somebody else will do it for her. And I told him, but I don't want to be part of this, this broken system. Ling launched a reusable cup venture in Vietnam, but is now focusing on bear pack in Singapore and beyond. The startup is expanding overseas, starting with France, where Ling's colleague Nicola handles the operation. After a few months, it's already growing faster than in Singapore. Most of my job is reaching out to, to vendors and growing the network. Tu vas bien? La forme? Au top. Vous allez continuer un petit peu, mais. Usually they accept right away because they, they don't have anything to risk. Working with Singapore, I think it's great. It's very insightful for, for the Paris team. It helps to grow our service already here, and we're going faster thanks to that. 
the French government is pressuring delivery platforms to reduce waste. So the timing is right for a move towards more circularity. I'm passionate about waste reduction, so I would not imagine myself working in any other project. I've worked in charities in the past, and now, after working in charities, I'm convinced that social enterprises are the key, um, because you need to, have, to make money in, a, in, in order to, to make your business, the, your impact sustainable. It's very promising for the future, and, and I think we can um, increase this impact in the next few months and years got from the vendors and the users are really good, they like it. Nice and classy, it fits the French area. My hope and my vision uh, on Bearpack is not only serving the takeaway and food delivery, it is our starter. What I want to see is I don't want to see a single-use plastic floating around the earth anymore. But while the packaging around food gets a lot of attention, what about the food itself? It turns out food production has a huge impact on the environment, but the circular economy might provide an answer. Food, it sustains us, but the way we make it and waste it is causing problems on a massive scale. And about one third of all food produced never makes it to consumers. Decomposing food in landfills gives off methane, a powerful greenhouse gas. In fact, if overall food wastage was a country, it would be responsible for the third largest emissions in the world. In New Zealand's largest city, some people are trying to make a difference. At a supermarket, staff are getting ready to open for the day. Henare Witihira puts out new bread to replace older loaves. Bread is New Zealand's most wasted food product, with more than 20 million loaves thrown away each year. Morning, boss. Morning, mate. How's it going, Donald? Yeah, good. You? But these loaves are going to take on a new life. Donald Shepherd is taking the bread, now converted into croutons, an hour outside Auckland. It's a beautiful day, and I love this drive up north. He's part of a new collective formed to address the country's food waste by creating new products for people to eat and drink. So I grew up on a dairy farm here in New Zealand and have been involved in food production, which historically has been very linear. You grow it, you produce it, you sell it, and then some of it ends up in, in, in landfill or waste. And then I had the opportunity to travel overseas and got really inspired by working with organisations in the UK that kind of opened my eyes up to the global challenge that is food going to waste. The destination is a brewery, where the bread is going to be turned into beer. The brewing process is just the same process as standard brewing. However, at Citizen, what we do is we replace 25% of the malt with a processed crouton bread. Everyone that has tried it has really liked the beer. Um, they love the story behind it, with it being recycled and reducing food to landfill, and all the bars and restaurants that sell it sell really well. But the story doesn't end here. The beer-making process creates spent grain. It would normally go to landfill or become animal feed. Always makes me hungry, this bit. But Donald has other plans for it. We've just finished the brew, so we've got a van full of spent grains, and the next step is to mill that into a spent grain flour. Hey Andrew, how are we? I'm good, thank you, how are you? Excellent. Back in Auckland, Donald delivers the flour to a colleague at a bakery, where it will be turned into artisan bread. 
It's been really interesting. It's been a difficult bread to make, to be perfectly honest, to start with, but people have got their head around the concept. There are a lot of people who really take a shine to this bread and the fact that we are doing that circular economy type uh, process, it has been really well received. Fantastic. There we go. It Break smells it open and... delicious. Oh, look at that. So the beauty of this batch of Citizen Baked Bread is that whatever doesn't sell tomorrow will go back up to the brewery to begin the beer making process again. So we go from bread to beer to bread to beer to bread to beer. Round and round we go. The collective is now moving on to New Zealand's other highly wasted foods, fruit and vegetables, to create sauces. And it's launching a drink from grape skins left over in the country's sizeable wine industry. They'll be sold at the country's largest supermarket chain alongside the beer, which is now back where it began its journey as bread. So we're pretty excited. We see this as more than just New Zealand. We really see the export potential of this. And when we're starting to talk export, you're talking about scale. And if you're talking about scale, that means a serious impact on reducing edible food that's currently going to waste. Hey, Shui. Hey. In Singapore, a new startup is also tapping into the sector known as food rescue. So saying this one is the one sweet sweet. You don't really want to sell anymore. Former law student turned social entrepreneur Preston Wong is at a warehouse picking up food that's about to expire. So you can see here, we have today, oh, like yogurts, and not just yogurts, but also other dairy products like cheeses. The retrieved goods are packed for resale. I think most people might have heard of food waste, but they might not know the eventual consequences of it. On Singapore in 2019 show that actually more than 700 million kilograms of food had been wasted. Our recycling rates are very low at about 18%. I actually witnessed my family clearing out the refrigerator of expiring but still consumable food items. And I thought to myself whether it was possible to redistribute them away using a platform. Preston and his co-founder Kenneth developed an e-commerce platform that offers surplus food at a discounted price. You could arrange for delivery or a pickup at our concept store. Hi, Rick. Okay, yeah, let me check on your order. So our target audience is actually not beneficiaries or the needy. So Treat Sure functions as a business model, as a business platform that will redistribute and connect businesses that have access food to consumers at a lower price. Preston does deliveries in his spare time. It helps him meet customers and gather feedback. Now, now there's like delivery of salmon, so you can actually get it delivered to you. We currently have over 25,000 users in our community and we have over 30 businesses that are on board right now. When I was faced with a choice between going down the normal path of perhaps a professional career in law, or accountancy or finance, I was also thinking that would I actually be better off creating a niche for myself in this area that perhaps nobody has touched. So I ventured into the unknown, ventured into a brand new territory. I felt that that was the path for me. Yeah. Back in New Zealand, another entrepreneur is tackling food that can't be rescued for human use. Ash. Andrew Fisher runs a plant that turns commercial food waste into animal feed for the country's massive agricultural sector. Even if we built like an overhead gantry, we lifted in and lifted out a component. New Zealand is a food basket that produces enough to feed many times its population. 3% of waste is normal for a factory. And when you've got the scale of New Zealand, it's actually quite a lot of food waste. So our products might be starter run, end of run, oversized, undersized products. The salt hasn't come in, the chocolate stopped pouring on it. 
Before this facility was set up, the surplus food was thrown away. New Zealand has more than 100 landfills, and they're a cheap way to dispose of surplus material. So the problem we've got is that 30 to 36% of what goes into a landfill is actually food waste. We're losing that opportunity to landfill, and that's, you know, it's a huge economic element that can be reused. The facility is a big achievement for a former army engineer. My engineering side's about infrastructure, uh, clean water, uh, doing things and, I guess, challenging myself. As the engineering mind, I guess, how can you do things better? The pulverised biscuits, bread and other food is ready for the next chapter in this food story. At a dairy farm south of Auckland, the cows know it's feeding time. The feed from Andrew's facility has been mixed in with grass and maize under the supervision of nutritionists. It currently accounts for only a small percentage of animal feed in New Zealand, but it has the potential to grow. I've been contract milking on this farm for 20 years. and We've just added this eco stock food into their diet. There's been a waiting list to get into it. It's very good feed, high in energy, carbohydrate, um, and at a good price. The supplement is high in energy, which produces more milk. So it'll be interesting to see over the next couple of months whether the cows increase milk production. But Andrew has much bigger ambitions than animal feed and milk production. Back at his processing plant, he has a new obsession. It's a pilot-size anaerobic digester. It takes food and converts it into other products, including energy. And for Andrew, it's the next logical step to harness the massive streams of food waste. In this process, biomass like food waste goes into a sealed tank. It's fed into a digester or reactor, where microorganisms spend days breaking it down. This gives off a methane-rich biogas that can generate heat and power. The leftover material is called digestate and is full of nutrients, making it a good fertilizer. And everyone can talk about you know, the big picture and everything else, but everything starts that first step, that first commitment. Yeah, it puts a big smile on my face. Near the North Island's geothermal heartland, the future is taking shape in the countryside. Andrew is at the site of the country's first commercial-scale anaerobic digester. He calls the venture EcoGas. This is the foundation to the tanks. This tank will be nearly 13 metres high. The plant will handle about 100,000 tonnes a year representing up to 10% of New Zealand's organic waste. It will provide heating and CO2 for local tomato greenhouses, fertiliser for local farms, and biogas that can be supplied to the natural gas grid. For me, this is 10 years in the, uh, the process. 12 months from now, it's going to be complete and actually doing what uh, the dream had been. The circular economy needs to have the same depth or width all the way around. You need to create something as big to cope with the scale of what's actually generated. And I don't think people understand the scale of waste and the need for infrastructure. The problem can only be solved by putting in this appropriate sized infrastructure. Andrew already has a partner who believes in his ambitious move into circularity. Yeah, so the health and safety measures you put in place here at a waste facility back in Auckland, the City Council's head of waste is checking on operations. Mixed in with the general rubbish heading for the landfill is food, attracting hungry scavengers. That's all about to change. We've been working to get um, a contract to divert our food scraps for quite some time. And now is the time to actually put that into action. And we've got a, an amazing contract with EcoGas to do that. Uh, working with Andrew has been really amazing. He, in my mind, he's a bit of a legend. His passion for that area is just enormous. It's a 20-year deal, starting in 2022, 
to divert food scraps from more than half a million households. This is the future for Auckland in terms of food scraps. So every urban household will get one of these. You put your food scraps in and you put it on the curbside and we will come and collect it every week. This then goes to Reparoa for EcoGas to process. Back at the site, Andrew sees the plant as the first of more than 20 nationwide. We've got an opportunity to actually create local energy centres, local fertiliser production and local employment. And the opportunity to turn into a good business at scale to give you know, economic outcomes, you know, it's, it's why I'm here. Similar technology is already well established in Singapore. Some think it's the answer to food waste. Others, though, are looking beyond traditional food. There's an alternative that would avoid waste and unlock a market worth billions. Okay, so we're going to watch this very short video, okay, on food waste. On a third day, definitely, in the At a primary school in Singapore, the future of food waste might already be here. While some countries are just starting down this road, the city has aerobic digesters of all sizes in schools, food courts and businesses. This small one can handle five kilograms of food a day. The food waste is digested by microorganisms. Within just 24 hours, it decomposes and is converted to dry organic fertilizer. The investor behind many of these machines only got into waste management two years ago. At that time, my instinct told me Sustainability is the future. I vision an opportunity to create a sustainable business that will be last perpetual. With Sanfran's background in digital tracking, it's no surprise he's adding data trackers to his digesters like this one, which can handle 500 kilograms of waste a day. Load cells weigh the food and radio frequency identification tracks its journey from food stalls to digester. I think we are the first in the industry to equip the digester with a computer system. And we also able to deploy some AI technology analysis to analyze the food waste generated on a money basis. It's a growing market because Singapore still incinerates hundreds of thousands of tons of food waste a year. So if we keep going on this, just imagine how many incinerators we have to build in Singapore. In Singapore, we are only a very tiny city. What's not tiny is the company's largest digester, which can handle one ton of waste daily. And there are big plans for the China market and at home in Singapore. I hope to see one day our smart digester will be in each HDB household. It's become part of their kitchen appliances. This will happen when the day of this digester cost come down tremendously. But is dealing with surplus food the only answer? Can we use technology to produce as much animal protein as we need, made to order, without waste. In a Singapore restaurant, there's a recent addition to the menu. This is chicken, but not as we know it. It's cultivated meat. It was launched to fanfare in late 2020, with Singapore the first country in the world to approve its sale. Singapore is also home to startups creating plant-based alternatives, but this chicken is real meat. The exact technique is a secret, but cultivated meat starts with cells from animal tissue. 
fat cells and muscle cells are separated. Nutrients are added, and one muscle cell can divide to produce billions of cells. Eventually, new cell strands form, and this tissue can then be layered back together to form meat. The entrepreneur behind the new meat on sale in Singapore is working remotely in Hawaii, away from his San Francisco headquarters. Josh Tetrick is convinced that the world's trillion dollar meat industry is going to change. Cultivated meat aligns with the circular economy because you're only making what you want. You don't have to have all the waste that normally comes from industrialized animal production. You don't need to have the millions of acres of land either. You don't need to have the billions of animals. It's simply a more efficient process from the start to the end. The benefits are economic, the benefits are environmental, and you know, to some extent, the benefits are also moral. The need is pressing because the world's appetite for meat is growing, along with a human population already heading towards 8 billion. What happens when we have 10 billion? Do we eventually use 90% of the habitable land of this one planet, the only one that we have, to plant soy and corn to feed the animals we eat? So what happens if we don't change it is instead of having a planet, we have an animal farm. Josh's company is now supplying a second Singapore restaurant. A delivery platform is helping get the new meat to consumers at home. It's still a pilot scheme, but with big plans ahead. It seems to be selling out, so that's good. Um, but people definitely like chicken and rice the most. And I still haven't tried the chicken and rice, which is kind of frustrating. Because you're not on the ground in Singapore, you're in Hawaii. <laughs> Singapore is one of the most forward-thinking countries on the planet. Um, they're thinking about a world 30 years from now as opposed to the world today. So um, as Singapore becomes a hub for manufacturing, then we look to other markets. We look to Indonesia, we look to China, we look to Japan. We can't ever forget in building out this company that more meat is being consumed in Asia than anywhere else. High-tech farms are planned, where chicken and eventually pork, beef and seafood will be cultivated in huge bioreactors. We can't just build them all tomorrow. But ultimately, they will be the, the infrastructure for how the world ends up consuming meat. This is uh, infrastructure that's similar to building the infrastructure out for the electric car economy. It doesn't exist today. We've got to build it from scratch. Um, and we all feel a real urgency uh, of doing it as fast as we can uh, today and not, and not waiting. Josh bought patents for the cultivated meat, developed by a Dutch inventor who didn't live to see the results. But in the Netherlands, Willem van Eelen's daughter is keeping his legacy alive. When Josh Tetrick called me, what actually happened is that Josh Tetrick started to explain cultivated meat to me. And then I said, hey, wait a minute, you're not gonna tell me what cultivated meat is, I'm gonna tell you. My father was in a Japanese prison of war camp and had been extremely hungry for years and years and years. So food was top of his mind. And after the war, he started medical school in Amsterdam. And he was brought into a, a lab space where they were keeping a piece of tissue alive. All of his fellow students saw this as something very interesting, medically interesting, whereas he immediately thought of it as food. Because he had been so hungry in Indonesia and in this prison of war camp that he had a food complex, as he called it himself. So he would see everything as a possible thing to eat. Hunger was an atrocity to him because he had seen what hunger does to people. Ira is an informal advisor to Josh's company, but has her own mission. She's at a dairy farm outside Amsterdam. The farmer, Leon Monen, is in the running to host the first farm where cultivated meat will replace meat from animals. And while Josh plans large new facilities, Ira wants Dutch cultivated meat to adapt existing infrastructure. On most farms, you already have barns 
And those are pretty big barns. You could put in bioreactors in a barn instead of animals. Want waar zijn deze dan? Heb je deze dan in Schotland ook gekocht? Nee, nee, nee. Deze dit... nee, is niet waar. Het komt uit de biesbos. Ira is working on a pilot project and hopes to see the first cultivated meat farm operational by 2025. I think it would make me a very happy trooper to be driving around uh, the countryside in the future. We're growing cells instead of animals that we bring to slaughter and growing animals that are not very good for our environment. My father would be right now very happy about what is going on, but also frustrated because, of course, for him, it should be in supermarkets all over the world already. But he would love somebody like Josh. He would love to see what's happening in Singapore. And he would love seeing me uh, talking to farmers and proving his idea that cultivated meat is perfect for farmers. So the circular economy is starting to take shape. But how fast will change happen? The world has finally realized that we have a really big problem. We know we can't keep doing the same things the same way. Innovators will lead the way to circularity. And so we need to change the way we make money. We need to change our business models. If we can't make money out of it, it's going to be very difficult to protect our planet. It's going to require a lot of work and a lot of investment. So we have our work cut out for us. And it's not something that is left for a futuristic future. No, it's here, it's now, it's possible. The circular economy allows us to create a livable, breathing, thriving planet without wasting it up. I truly believe that society can change and evolve into a more circular economy. And my hope is that we can do it quickly and effectively.